Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras to Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. According to data from the National Center for Educational T Statistics, in 2013, nearly 16% of public school students in New Mexico are participating in programs for English language learners. Today we talk about a pioneer in bilingual education, Maria Gutierrez Spencer, who recently was honored with a historical landmark on the campus of New Mexico State University. Maria Gutierrez Spencer passed away in 1992 Joining us today is her daughter, Dr. Lara Gutierrez Spencer, who works as director of Chicano programs at NMSU. She will share with us details about her mother's work as well as her own work here with Chicano programs in higher education. Laura, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. I'd like to start off and talk about a little bit about your mother. Um, you know, it must have been a great honor to have this historical landmark um, right on the campus, a uh, higher education campus here at New, at New Mexico State University. How did that feel? It, it's just wonderful. I, I've been telling people I'm still, it's, it's hard to believe that it's there. You know, I heard about it about a couple years ago, the idea of it and it was being worked on, but it's really, I've still pinched myself. And my goodness, that's there and it's gonna be there for a long time. It's a great honor. Um, she, she did do a great deal for the state of New Mexico and as a, I was talking to a friend who now lives in California and he kept saying she did a lot for the country. She really was a pioneer in bilingual education but locally she also did a lot of work for people, for families and social justice even after she was retired and it's just so gratifying for our family to, to have that there. We're, we're very grateful and for the, the prominent position where it's been placed. Well one of the things I find interesting about your mother's story mm -hmm. is that she grew up during the depression time where you know people were struggling across the country mm -hmm. however she wasn't i mean she was brought up in a pretty privileged background mm -hmm. did she ever share what it was um that really inspired her to go into that type of work um i for one thing i think her father very much inspired her her father like a lot of men of the day uh, was very intelligent but only had a sixth grade education um, he, but he could do all the complicated math in his head. He was very bright. He just never, he, he came from a very poor family from here, from Las Cruces, from the east side barrio. Um, but he was very hardworking and he was very smart and he became an entrepreneur. He uh, apprenticed as a pharmacist and, and he never went to college but became a pharmacist later on when a law was passed that you, you had to, you know, pass this pharmacy degree and have degrees, there were a number of, of old guys in, Los, in uh, New Mexico who didn't have college degrees, so they had to study for the pharmacy test and pass it, and only then could they be recertified. So, but he was also a, a businessman and an entrepreneur, and he was very, very generous. Um, we, we knew that, but the family didn't realize a lot of what he had done until he passed. I remember his funeral, um, I was young, and a lot of people came up to my mother and my uncles and said, your father, uh, gra yeah, your father or my grandfather sent me or s this person in my family to college. Um, Jesus gave my father free medicine when he was dying. Uh, Jesus did this, Jesus did that. I mean, people came out of the woodwork to tell us many, many kind, generous things he did for people because he had grown up poor, he knew what it was like. And very quietly, usually anonymously, if he could, he would, he would do those things. So my mother was very influenced by that. And so she grew up very middle class. Um, there were servants in the home. Um, her, her mother did not have a college education, but she was from sort of the, the upper middle class or middle class of Chihuahua, came here as a refugee. She read a great deal. Elegance was very important to her. She dressed great. So she had, my mother had piano lessons. Um, she knew she had a lot of privilege. And then she wanted to go to Berkeley for college. So uh, before World War II, she, she uh, was able to go to Berkeley, which was very rare in those days. Even a lot of men, um, Anglo, well off Anglo men didn't go away or out of state, certainly to college. Some of the Catholic men of the time, if they were really privileged, went to Notre Dame, I heard. But, so that was, that was a big deal, and her father could pay for it, and, and she had the grades. So um, she knew she had privilege. So she did a similar thing for my sister and myself. 
she, as we were growing up, she said, this is the way the middle class does things. And if you know the rules of the middle class, and she said, it's not always so much about money, that if you, if you know the rules of the middle class, even though you may not have much in resources, you can climb that ladder and, and be successful and, and, and have a better lifestyle later on, get that education and whatnot. Um, for example, there were some miners in Grant County who made a lot of money. They made more money um, than my father, who was a college professor. But she said, you know, if those families don't know the lessons of the middle class, it will be harder for their children to get the college degree and get the professional job and, and you know, kind of climb the, the economic ladder in this country, or any country, really. So, so she, she taught that to me from a very young age, but she also taught me how in, uh, poor people have wonderful values and poor people uh, have a lot to offer. For example, she used to notice, and she would see this in her classrooms, that middle class children, no matter their race or ethnicity, tend to be self-centered and even selfish um, because that's the way middle class children are brought up. Middle class children are brought up this is your room, these are your clothes, these are your things, these are mommy and daddy's things, these are your things, these are your sister's things. There's a lot of division of, of property and space and time in the middle class home, at least in our country. And in poor families, you can't afford to do that. You don't have your own room growing up. You may not even have your own bed growing up. And the whole family needs to share to survive. So she used to show me how some of the poor children in her class, very bright, but poor children were so generous and so giving. And they would, like the teachers would have a little party when they finished reading a book in the first grade and they would make, it was a gingerbread man, so they'd make a gingerbread cake. And some of these kids were hungry. And they would give a piece of cake and a cookie and some punch to each little child. And a lot of these kids would drink their punch, but they, they would carefully wrap up the cookie and the cake and wouldn't touch it. And they would say, well, why aren't, why aren't you eating your cake? No, I'm gonna save it for my brothers and sisters. And they would have the like, gay hey, brothers and sisters. Middle-class kids don't do that, you know. Yeah. And uh, I saw this with my, my middle-class, some, some colleague friends of mine, when I lived in Las Vegas, they adopted this little girl. And they spent all this time with her. Juliana, don't touch mommy and daddy's books, read your books. Juliana, don't touch daddy's stereo, use your play school, you know, little tape player. Juliana, don't touch mommy's computer, use your computer. And she had a laptop, IBM laptop, and she knew how to use it at three, you know, it was her laptop. Wow. So there's all this division of objects and space and your room and our room and all these things. So then I was there one day when they bring the neighborhood child over and they said, Juliana, play with your friend, share. And Juliana's like, don't touch my toys, these are my toys, don't come in my, well of course, because what that's that? what her yeah. parents had taught her that. And we don't realize that's what we're teaching children. And then we're like, well, why don't they want to share it? Well, you know, you spent 90% of your time teaching them this division. Um, so she also taught me, you know, there, there are really some really great family values in uh, poor families, like uh, remaining close to your family, getting to know your family. Mm -hmm. um, so, so she taught me a lot growing up, and it, and it influenced me a lot, and, and she mentored uh, a lot of people. Hey, you mentioned this kind of uh, sharing and, um, you know, finding... Uh, some sort of, um, I think that's that's kind of one of the other things I thought about when I was learning about your mother's work was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was providing opportunities for those who didn't have opportunities in school mm -hmm. by helping them learn English or mm -hmm. learn Spanish even for native Spanish speakers. Right. And so I, I'd like if, you, what was her really motivation to do that work in Silver City at a time when, you know, uh, people uh, didn't exactly mix with uh, with people from different classes, different races. Mm -hmm. um, could you share with us a little bit about why she she saw the need to do that? Yeah. Well, she we moved to Silver City because my dad got an opportunity to be a professor at Western, so she left her family and you know went. We we moved there, and um, she was looking for a job, and so she walked into the school district. And first, there was in a way there was one job waiting for her. The um, superintendent had been. Uh, talked to with some of the local high society uh, white ladies that mostly the, some of the wives of the mining executives had talked to him they said we're very concerned we know there are deep ethnic there's a deep ethnic divide in Grant County it was long t long term and she said our children 
I, we, the, our generation, we don't talk to each other much, the Mexican-Americans and the Anglos primarily. And our children need to be able to talk to each other. So what can we do so that our children can, can talk to each other and communicate and bridge this gap? Maybe we should have a, um, a program in Spanish in the elementary schools so that the Anglo kids can learn Spanish and it'll give pride in the Spanish-speaking kids and whatnot. So my mother walked in just as the superintendent was looking for this kind of person and she had this background in linguistics and teaching languages. So he hired her and she kind of had to figure out the job. So she went from classroom to classroom to classroom in the elementary school. She had a big straw bag full of uh, puppets and props and crowns and you know, all these different props and she would teach these little dialogues in Spanish and colors and different things and made it very fun, very interactive and she'd come in I think it was about 20 minutes per classroom or half an hour per classroom once a week or something and she finally kind of became like the Pied Piper. Kids would get so excited because she always would do something fun uh, and I remember her coming into my classroom and, and doing that. So she did that for a while and then I think she saw, she saw the need. She saw that, uh, like in a lot of places in the country, what was happening to non-English speaking kids, they were coming into the schools and they were being given intelligence tests in English. And because they didn't understand English, they were flunking the test and they were being categorized as mentally disabled. And uh, a kind of similar thing happened to her, she was not labeled that way and her principal caught it really quickly but something similar happened to her when she entered first grade uh, not speaking English and so um, uh, she realized what an injustice this was and how bad it was for our country we we're, were losing all this potential and some of these kids were absolutely brilliant and uh, some, a lot of them were just normal so she created this bilingual program called BOLD and very soon began to get federal funding for it and so in th it was a three-year program from first to third grade. They would take in these students, mostly Mexican-Americans. There were some Chinese, I think there was an African student. Anyway, uh, bring them in, give them a lot of English as a second language. Uh, I think it was half a day. And then the rest of the day, they would teach them social studies, science, and reading and writing literacy in their own language because studies showed that for children, if you don't learn certain concepts by a certain age, it's very hard to catch up. So while they were catching up in English on one hand, they were doing you know, the science and uh, social studies and uh, the reading and writing and developing those skills and math also in, in Spanish. So that by the fourth year, they could transition into a regular classroom and, and do really well. So within, the, within three years, the children in her program, the overwhelming majority came from very poor, disadvantaged backgrounds, were beating me and my cohort, uh, the, the students in, in, you know, that had the best teacher because we were the children of the mining executives or the professors, and uh, they were beating us. Wow. And that was very threatening to the status quo. So here, here you have people that wanted to in install this program and it, it took off and became a success. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there are people in the community in Silver City, Grant County that found this program as a threat to their children. Kind of. I, I mean, guess. she was being honored with national awards at the time. And you mentioned that yeah. she something happened at the same time she was getting yep. national recognition for this program. Mm -hmm. The year she was fired. She after she had won three national awards for excellence and in innovation in education, she was fired by the local school board. Uh, and it was the second attempt, very serious attempt to fire her. Uh, there were people in town that were saying terrible things about her and the program and the teachers and what was going on. People who knew nothing of the program had never been to see the program knew nothing directly, but were just passing on these, these rumors, unfounded rumors. There was a rumor, someone said that she had heard, that uh, she had been raised in Mexico and trained uh, and brought here to the United States uh, to overthrow the U.S. government. And she used to laugh and say, well, you know what? If I was going to overthrow the U.S. government, I don't think I'd start in Silver City. <laughs> it was not exactly the center of power. Uh, so uh, uh, very crazy things went on. Um, she was um, a principal at the school, assigned a teacher to be her bodyguard when she went to the restroom in the school because he was afraid that another teacher might try and assault her. Um, wow. I was afraid for her uh, physically. I'm surprised because sometimes I, we would walk into the wrong room and receive a very chilly reception at best, if not hostile. 
and um, yeah, so um, I, I, I was afraid for her, and she admitted to me in front of me once when she was talking to someone else uh, th that she shared those, those fears, and her staff suffered backlash, um, our, our family suffered backlash from that. It was a, it was a very difficult time. Uh, but the governor came in, so, so the idea was, I think, by her opponents, was her most virulent opponents, was to fire her, get rid of her, take all the federal money, which is quite a bit of funding at the time, and give it to kids like me in the more Anglo-dominated middle-class classrooms. Well, you can't do that with funding. That's not, you know, you have to give it to, to the program to which it's been allotted. So the governor came in and uh, took that line item away and gave it to the Deming Public Schools. And so my mother's program continued in Deming and it was established as a statewide teacher training center f uh, focusing on bilingual education. So teachers came from all over the state, would go observe and, you know, do some work with my, my mother and the other teachers. And then they'd go back, apply what they'd learned, and then my mother would travel up to their classroom, observe, give them feedback. So it was kind of this training loop yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know your mother. Um, I guess uh, to talk about this, um, we she was honored uh, with Rosa Parks mm -hmm. with the Wonder mm -hmm. Woman Award in the 1980s. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Wonder Woman Foundation ran out of money. It no longer exists, but it was a wonderful program. She was nominated by one of her former employees, Marina Dominguez, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But um, so a number of women were were awarded at this ceremony. I want to say 13 or 14 women. So it was a pretty big number at the the um, uh, Plaza Hotel in New York City. Unfortunately, I couldn't go, but my dad went with her, of course. And it was really, it was really cool. Um, the, um, Bill Moyers and Polly Bergen gave her award. Two celebrities would give each woman her award. Rosa Parks was one of the women awarded. Another woman awarded was uh, Clara Hale of Hale House in New York. She and her daughter would take in crack babies that were born addicted to tr crack and, and heal them. So my mother and, and Clara Hale became friends and Clara has now passed away. So it was, it was just a wonderful recognition. Wonderful. So what about you know, your, your mother's work? Uh, was there something about her work that can inspire you, her to go, you to go into your field that you're yes. doing right now uh, with uh, Chicano programs in higher education? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that I grew up, when I grew up in Silver City, um, for many people, the word Mexican was an insult. It was a dirty word. That was a fighting word. And how dare you call me that word? And that is such an injustice. I was so fortunate because I, I my mother, it was my mother and my father, um, they used to take tours to Mexico over the summer. That was their summer job since they were teachers or summer business. And so I grew up going to the Palacio de Bellas Artes, the, the, the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City, of seeing the great pyramids, of seeing the great paintings, learning about the great writers, of the great achievements of the Mexican civilization, both ancient and modern. And uh, there was such a gap between my perception of what I knew to be real and there, and so many kids that were growing up that were being made to feel that they were inferior. And so that, that really inspired me. I ended up being a Spanish major, and I was going to be a high school teacher. Then I couldn't get a job teaching high school in the state of New Mexico. I applied all over the place. I had good grades and you know studied abroad. But I, and I know it's because I was my mother's daughter and, and I was seen as dangerous. So I ended up going to grad school. You know, I was like, okay, let's keep going to school. And um, so anyway, so yeah, it, it very inspired me and I ended up um, also being a teacher of Spanish for native speakers. My mother was a pioneer in that in the 1950s. She was teaching Spanish for native speakers in Las Cruces High School. And uh, I know a lot of our high schools in New Mexico don't have that these days. Some do, but a lot don't, it's too bad because students come in with that rich language and instead of developing that more, uh, either they don't do that or um, you know, they don't have that opportunity. But I, I did that and uh, became a professor of, of literature and I was at UNLV as a professor and I just, I really wanted to come home. I, I, wasn't, I was happy in my job, but uh, personally I, I wanted to come home. My mother had passed away, my dad was here, so I found out about this job at Chicano Programs and although it's not an academic position, I still work mostly with students I, and I really enjoy that. We do outreach into the community. Um, I get to do presentations, so I get to kind of teach a little bit, but I don't have to grade, so it's nice I don't have to <laughs> do grade papers anymore. But, uh, so yeah, it's still, it's still very much involved in education and trying to foment change. What's a, a student, say like a freshman student coming in, going to find in 
your department, department and your yeah. office? Yeah. yeah, so let me clarify because a lot of people still think that we're Chicano Studies. So we're not Chicano Studies, although I've done that in the past. That's not, not what I do now. Um, so we're, we're a support office. So let's say we, if a student has a question about a situation in the classroom with another fac if the faculty member or another student, they're not sure what's the appropriate way to proceed with a problem or a complaint or an issue, we advise them on that, how the university system works, how it's organized. Uh, maybe it's a question about financial aid or scholarships. Get them to the right people, especially for financial aid. I don't get into the details of financial aid, but help them find the right person that can answer their questions. Help them find scholarships. We administer some scholarships th through Chicano programs. We uh, do leadership development with the Hispanic student organizations. Um, so, so that's a lot. We do some activities. So that's a lot of what the students see. Um, some of the things that the college students don't see is we go into the community and do workshops on preparing for college for parents and high school students to, to help them get prepared because, you know, it can be a mystery. How do you apply for scholarships and what's this thing, financial aid, they keep talking Not about? Not only a mystery, it can be pretty intimidating. It, it really can. It really can. And if you don't know who to ask, um, yeah, so we do that. And we advocate when there are meetings, we're thinking of changing programming at NMSU. It's very important, all the diversity offices, we, we try to speak for our constituency, what we're seeing and what they need. Because after all, NMSU is a land grant institution, which means providing an education that yes, has a focus to some extent on agriculture and engineering is very important in the liberal arts but also a big part of the Morrill Act, the land grant, original land grant legislation, talks about the importance of educa educating the industrial classes of the state, which we know now as the, as the working classes. And so um, different groups have specific needs, especially if your parents didn't go to college. You can be very bright and studying very hard, but not have an even playing field in terms of, of opportunity to, to excel. I mean, how is uh, that going for the university and then in higher education? Um, what do you know as far as, um, you know, Chicano students finishing college? You know, a lot of people think that we're in great shape at NMSU because the majority, the, the biggest percentage of students at NMSU are Hispanic. That's true. But if you look at the graduation rates, it flips. We, uh, Hispanic students, Native American students, African American students are not graduating at the same rate as Anglo students. And, and, and there also is a difference between Anglo students who, who come from the middle class or higher income or lower. And income has a very direct effect on your chances of graduating from college, you know, for, for many reasons. But, um, but it's also race and ethnicity. Some, some of our students, so we know there's an issue. We've been working on this for a long time and the statistics are there. The statistics are very clear. We're not doing a good enough job in supporting these students and, and of course they have to work they have to to apply themselves no one's saying that, that we're just gonna give them something but um, um, I think we need to truly truly live our land-grant mission as an institution we need to always be working to make sure that we're not like I talk to some people when they're planning programming and they say well when I was in college well yeah. okay for me when I was in college the internet didn't exist. Um, technology was so different. Um, we're always changing in the office. We're throwing out things that people don't use anymore that used to be important five years ago. I was like, well, people don't use that anymore. Um, so we have to, one, remember that it's a different world. Two, some student, if your parents didn't go to college, there are so many things that they're not going to understand. They could be very supportive of you going to college, but there's many things that they could do or say that are counterproductive to that student succeeding. Like, for example, saying, um, I want you to live at home. Uh, because the parent very naturally thinks, I want to I wanna open your door at night and see you sleeping peacefully in your bed, and that's going to make me feel so good because you're close to me and I know you're safe. Yeah, but the parent may not know that students sometimes have to stay late studying in a, in a library or in a computer lab that even if they have a laptop, they're going to be need to be on campus sometimes at night. So, you know, they won't be driving home sometimes till late at night. That that what they're missing out on in programming, in free tutoring in the dorms or, or other places. Uh, that and now I will say, 
not all families can have students in the dorms. Yeah. It, it's it's m quite a bit more expensive, or living in an apartment next door. I'm I'm not saying that, but there are there are things like for example, a parent will say, well, well, why aren't you home? It's two o'clock in the morning, and sort of assume that they're partying. They might be. Uh, that happens. I won't say that doesn't happen, but very often students are in the computer lab. They are in a study group. Study groups is something I don't know when you went to college or yeah. went to college, but when I went to college, there were no you know formal projects that you had to do as a group. It was all very individual. Yeah. Um, so so that's very different. Um, and it's hard for those parents to to understand really impossible and sometimes to support those students. So we need centers like this who can help students adjust both as first generation students and culturally. Um, because that's one of the things we do is explain, okay, this is how the Anglo middle class workplace or, or culture works. Yeah, I like to get, so we, you, you know, you, you know that you got to get them used to, or at least understanding Aware. campus. Mm -hmm. We only have about a minute, less oh. than a minute left, but I'd like to hear like, what are some of the things you're seeing that are helping kind of uh, get that education out there at an early age? and even for the parents to understand mm -hmm. how to navigate the whole process. Well, one thing for the parents I want to say real quick, for the past few years, um, our, the division, our vice president, Dr. Montoya's division, has done uh, orientation sessions in Spanish for family members, parents. That has been a huge help to help tr that translate. Um, for outreach for young people, I think we're working more and more on recruitment and getting into to high schools, getting into early grades. And it's more of a challenge because legislation and things have happened in the public schools. It's made it harder to get into the public schools, to classrooms, for example, but um, community groups, nonprofits, uh, churches, uh, we're, we're trying a number of different ways to, to communicate. I got you. Thank you very much for joining us and thank sharing. You. We're out of time, uh, but thank you very much for sharing. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining us here on Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno.